So it's a, it's a real privilege to, to introduce um, uh, a good friend, the Secretary General of the ITU, Hamid um, Tori. And you know, he's here actually in Washington, New York this week, not just because of the um, uh, UN General Assembly meeting, but yesterday we had, uh, I guess it was at the sixth meeting of the UN Broadband Commission. And uh, the UN Broadband Commission actually, in my mind, is a real embodiment of the vision of uh, the Secretary General. Um, when the Secretary General left the, the private industry and came to the ITU, um, what about 14 or 15 years ago was it now? Uh, to head up what's called the D sector, the development sector. Uh, he had a vision that uh, we could actually have something like the mobile miracle. Uh, and he completely and totally revitalized what's called BDT, this development sector within the ITU, uh, creating something called the Global Symposium for Regulators, which brought together uh, regulators from around the world to talk about pre best practices. How can you actually create the right regulatory and policy environment so that you would have investment, so that we can connect people? Um, when you, I forget what the statistics are, but when you started at BDT, uh, there certainly were fewer than a billion, I suspect fewer than 500 million mobile customers around the world. We now have, what, almost six billion connections. Um, and then six, seven years ago, he became the Secretary General, uh, overseeing all the parts of the ITU, and that's the telecom sector, the radio sector. We've talked about um, radio in terms of the importance of spectrum and continuous, and now continuing also with the work in the development sector. Uh, the Broadband Commission was his vision, and it was to bring together, uh, he co-chairs this uh, with Irina Bakova from uh, UNESCO, and there are two co-chairs outside of the, the, the UN, the, uh, he and Irina Bakova are the two uh, UN co-chairs. The co-chairs of the UN Broadband Commission are Carlos Slim uh, from uh, Mexico and uh, President uh, Paul Kagame from uh, uh, Rwanda. And over the last three years, uh, these six meetings, uh, the UN Broadband Commission started out by defining what we mean by broadband, setting out global broadband goals. Uh, one of those was that it was an, a very important recommendation that every country should have a broadband strategy or a broadband policy or plan. And one of the reports yesterday at the Broadband Commission was that we now have 119 countries in the world with national broadband plans and strategies. And this is the direct result of the UN Broadband Commission. And it, the UN Broadband Commission also tied broadband to the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, and there are eight M, what we call MDGs. And directly relating broadband to the majority, with seven out of the eight uh, MDGs. And why broadband, not just internet, but broadband internet is important to the global economic development, social development, uh, health care, children, uh, closing gender gaps uh, programs for women and children. So it's a real privilege to introduce the Secretary General who's here to real, to today to talk about um, the other part of um, uh, what the ITU does, which is this conference that's coming up uh, in December in Dubai, the World Conference on International Telecommunications. So, Mr. Secretary General, it's a real pleasure, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I see many friends uh, in this room, uh, including uh, Bob Pepper himself, uh, Eli, and uh, uh, Matthias Kort uh, is here, and uh, I see Dr. Uh, Hesa Al Jabbar uh, from my city, Qatar, uh, my good friend, uh, Ambassador David Gross, uh, a longtime friend of ITU and uh, very active. Uh, he played a uh, key role in uh, putting, making sure that the uh, U.S. continues to be respected in the international arena. And uh, I fully uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity of coming here this afternoon. And uh, in this, and when I see the, the title of this, the state of telecoms, uh, 
I wonder why people are talking about internet and uh, you're, you're talking about telecom here. And uh, but uh, the reality is that uh, telecoms and internet are meant to work side by side, work together. These are two worlds that are condemned to work together, and they have already been working. They've been working together for all these years. Uh, you, when you want an internet connection anywhere. Uh, in a new house or a new uh, business, the ISP will ask you if you have a telephone line and then will give you internet connection. If you don't have a phone line, they still can give you internet connection and they will give you a phone line as well, in addition. The, uh, we have uh, 6 billion mobile devices today. We hope that each and every one of them will have the capability of providing internet connection. And uh, telephone devices will be the ones that are carrying the same thing. So there is a need for these two societies to work together. And I've been, in my job, facing that uh, challenge of uh, people, people trying to oppose them. And I'm still trying to understand why. And I can't simply understand why people are opposing them. They need to work together. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are so many things that we've done together, look at all the standards we brought in the telecom sector. During the, this thing, debate started in the, during the WISIS process, the World Summit on Information Society. As you know, the WISIS was uh, the result of the so-called Mainland Commission report that was back in the 1980s. That said 20 years to bridge the so-called uh, gap, the missing link report that set a very ambitious target in 1980 that every citizen of this planet should be within five kilometers distance at least, walking distance, five kilometers maximum. And that was too ambitious to a telephone booth. That was, a, that was the objective there. And in 1998, when I was being elected director of the Brahma sector, we were analyzing the progress made for the maintenance report. And the result was stunning. We did not make any progress. We we're failing two years before the deadline. We we're not there, and we we're not going to be there. And why? <coughs> Our people said, we are trying to do this alone in ITU at that time. Of course, nobody else was dealing with this. We said, why are we trying to do this alone? This, we are now entering the information society. This is a problem involving everyone. Let's organize a world summit on information society, inclusive to everyone. And let's call on all the stakeholders. Let's make it a stakeholder issue. And call on everyone, including civil society, private sector and governments, all talking on this equal footing. It was the first time a UN agency was organizing a summit. For those of you who've been there in 2003, in Geneva, in 2005 in Tunis, it's the first time the UN was organizing a summit where there was no demonstrations outside. <laughs> why would you demonstrate outside in the, in the heat, or in the cold of Geneva, or in the heat of Tunis, <clears throat> while you can go and talk in the, in the air-conditioned room like anybody else? And that's what everybody did. <laughs> and now we are moving toward a new goal. From the information society to the knowledge society, that's our ultimate goal where we need to work together. And I remember in 2008, I believe I was invited by the ICANN board in, 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 in Cairo. I showed up there to address the board. Because I don't see any reason why we should be opposing. Of course, some of them told me very politely that when we invited you, we didn't expect you to come. <laughs> but I did go. Because I'm trying to keep a hand here. I mean, there's no reason why we should not be working together. The fight is simply not good for anybody, simply not for the citizen that we are trying to protect. To, we, to whom we are trying to give the right to communicate as a basic human need. And I don't say as a basic human right because those things are very complex. I mean, our organization is a technical organization. We're not equipped to dealing with uh, those human rights issues, there are some agencies that are dealing with and they are doing very well their job. 
There is a UN Charter, Article 19 of the UN Charter is very well defining what is human right and others. Very, very carefully defined. We don't want to question that. <clears throat> We're organizing the ITRs now because back in 1988, we needed to put some uh, regulation, a light touch regulation, because if you look at the ITRs, it's 99 pages. It's half A4 page size. 99. On an A4 size, it will be uh, uh, 45 pages. Total. And the first 33 pages are the list of the people who are have, who have ratified the convention. If for something to, to last 25 years, if it's too much detail, it will be it will be obsolete before even the ink dies. Back then, telephone was the only main element we have. We had, and at that time, the only measurement for telephone uh, settlement at the time, and we're not talking, we're no longer talking about the settlement now, that's old fashioned. That was the old telephone at the time. Today we're talking about that piece and bytes. It's no longer voice telephony, it's voice, video, and data all combined. At that time, the elements of measurement was time of phone calls, distance between callers, and their locations completely irrelevant today, all three parameters. How do we make sure that all citizens of this planet have access to the goodies of this knowledge society? Internet is a tiny part of the traffic. You have a lot of video traffic and, and, and data traffic that are going out there. We have to be frank about it. When, during the uh, WISIS process, when politicians were asking me about internet governance, I was telling them, especially for those from the uh, developing countries that I was dealing with, I say, before you talk about internet governance, get internet first. Let's, let's get it help you to get internet access. And we still have two-thirds of the human population that is not accessing internet yet. Our challenge is how to make sure we have access to internet to them on an access and an affordable access and secure access. People say, why are you talking about affordability? I mean, affordability is an issue. Uh, before coming here today, I, I, I was very careful. I went to the, at the reception of my hotel and asked them to print the, my bill for me. I wanted to see my bill. Because I took three days subscription for internet in my hotel room, it's $34 per day. And I had the misfortune of, of uh, of uh, connecting a second device, I was charged twice. <laughs> I, I have the bill for anyone who <laughs> <laughs> uh, Last month, I had a meeting in Geneva with one of the ministers, minister from South Africa, a lady. She told me she was in Belgium, and she was uh, stunned when she came back home and saw her, her telephone bill. She was paying $3 a minute for, for roaming, and she didn't know. I had the same thing. Once I was in uh, one country and I had uh, uh, a conference there, I was making some phone calls. I didn't know I was paying, I, I was, I was uh, paying $3 a minute. When I came home, I had, I had a bill of $2,000. First, when I saw the bill, I thought that uh, uh, the telephone company was sending me a gift. <laughs> <laughs> These are some of the problems we're dealing with and we're talking about today. And I can afford it, given the job that I'm doing. But $34 is higher than the monthly income of some people in the world world. How do we make sure that they have access so that they can also exercise the same right as everyone else? We put the, we, uh, uh, Bob mentioned the Robert Commission. The Robert Commission was set in, in response to UN Secretary General's uh, call for all the UN heads to help him to accelerate meeting the Canadian Development Goals. That was back in 2009, when he asked us to do that. To be frank with you, some of my colleagues immediately were taking the floor and saying, well, Mr. Secretary General, we're running the risk of not meeting the goal. The MDGs, everyone was showing off and showing. They were predicting, predicting failure. So come to 2015, they'll say, see, I told you, you're not going to meet it, and proudly. 
Oh, I saw this coming. <laughs> I'm from one of the least developed countries in the world, personally. And I, to me, the question is not whether or not you're going to meet the goals. I cannot predict failure. I should do something about it. To me, what do we do to meet the goals? That's why I said, <laughs> let me put a, a, a commission together that will help uh, because among the eight goals, the last goal, the, which is a, 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 a talking about partnership actually, and ICT is part of that component, <coughs> the, it's the only uh, goal that is likely to be met. There are 18 objectives that are coming out of those uh, that derived from the eight goals. And among them again, the, the, the objective number 18 is the one dealing with ICT. Those are the only ones that are likely to be met. So I'm saying, how about using that to accelerate our meeting the goals? E health, e education. Three of the goals were, are, are about uh, uh, disease, which is people, or women or children, or uh, you know, health. Yesterday at the commission, um, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who is in charge of the, who is advising the UN Secretary General on MDGs, was telling us what it costs to cure malaria. I'm sure many of you here have heard of malaria and you think that it's, not, it's a, a disease that is not curable. I had malaria at least five times in my life. It's curable if it's, if it's uh, diagnosed within the first 24 hours. The, uh, the cure rate is 100%. 100 and by techniques that are that, uh, um, uh, Jeffrey Sachs is using now in the so-called Millennium Villages. By using a simple fo uh, mo mobile phone, you can test the, 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 the blood sample. It costs 80 cents to do that. The testing will cost 80 cents. And within one hour, you have the result. Mm -hmm. And the treatment for malaria costs 80 cents as well. 700,000 children are dying every year. For that. So we're saying our technology can help bring here and save lives. How do we make it affordable to everyone? That's a key question for us. On Saturday, I had the pleasure of participating in the Mashable Social Good Summit, where I was delighted to see the audience's passion for technology. The use of the use of younger young generation, they are passionate about it, and they are willing to help and do something. So, the, and again, at the Broadband Commission yesterday, we had uh, a very good visit from uh, 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 one of our uh, uh, um, invited guests, Gina Davis. Gina Davis, uh, I named her Special Ambassador of ITU for gender, for, for, for girls, ICT and girls, uh, in May this year. And she did a fantastic job promoting women in ICT. She came to the commission and challenged us to put together a working group for gender, for gender, for women. And we did meet the challenge because one of the commissioners, the commissioner, Dr. Reza Jafari, actually immediately pledged one million dollars for that, for that working group. We're going to have real actions that will be making a difference and hope that others will come and join us as well. And therefore, we have the issues that we are dealing with here can have real, real difference. Now, people are asking why we want to do the ITRs now. I'm sure many people will question, yes, ITU is, is relevant, but ITRs is an old story. Yes, the old ITRs, which is an old story. That's why we're trying to be saying it lasted 25 years. We need to find a new business model now that, that where there will be more encouragement in investment in traffic and in the networks that are carrying the traffic. When you look at the, the data traffic and voice video, it's exponential growth. But the investment in the infrastructure is not is steady, but it's not as exponential as it is. And we know you can do the statistics and see that you go against the wall at one point in time if there's not enough investment to carry this. To ministers, uh, who are not at all technologically oriented, I am giving them the analogy of roads and cars. I'm saying 
uh, we have a group that is dealing making roads, building roads, and uh, those groups that are building cars. It's not because you build the roads that you're going to own the cars. Just certainly not the road, the, 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 the goods that are transporting. It's not, it's not at all. But you need to know the weight, the size, the number of cars running on a daily basis. And you'll be involved in that standardization. You tell them, look here, don't make your truck bigger, your truck bigger than, higher than this height, otherwise they won't pass under my, under the bridges I'm building. Or the bridges will cost me too much. Or don't make them, uh, uh, the weight height bigger than 10 or 15 tons, otherwise the bridges will collapse. Those are the type of things we do. So when I ask how many cars you, what are the times you are driving your cars and things like that, oh, you want to own my car? No. That's the relationship between the telecom world and the internet world. And they need to work together. I challenge anyone. I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I, am, I work in government, in private sector, and then came back in the UN organization. The oldest UN agency that has survived 147 years, which means the two world wars, which means the 70 years or so of Cold War, where Soviet Union and USSR, USSR and, and the US and its allies were working side by side. Otherwise, there would be no satellites in orbit. There would be no spectrum managed. There would be a spectrum jam. We had done that. Agreeing on every single moment and making global standards Otherwise, we won't be able even to talk to each other to declare war. But hopefully, to make peace. If the telephones are not on the same standard, they won't work. That's what's happened in this industry so far, and that's, this is the only organization on the UN, uh, in the UN where I will see uh, Ambassador David Gross. So he, he's very well uh, used to that when he was ambassador to the United States in, in, inside the ITU, he would make a proposal. Guess who would take the floor and say, I suppose, I support the, the proposal made by my good friends from the US? Iran or Syria. That's not unusual in ITU. And I would expect David to, to take back the floor and say, I don't know what's wrong with what I said, I will throw it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would expect from him. They know he would not do that because we are dealing with technical issues. <coughs> All technical problems have technical solutions. Political problems don't have solutions, unfortunately. We know that. They are trying to take us into human rights issue, in the transparency issues, in those that are, have really where yeah, people have different definitions of those things, unfortunately. And that we're trying to go back to the UN charter where definition has already all been agreed so that they don't question that otherwise they won't agree again. <coughs> That's what we're trying to do. But those are very important issues, we agree. But it's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with affordability. We will we try to see how the access can be affordable. And we'll be dealing with how it can be accessible to people with different type of handicaps no matter where they live and no matter what their circumstances are. <coughs> it will be dealing with roaming issues. We should not hide ourselves, uh, you know, the problem. We have to face them. Roaming is an issue. Why not deal with it? Why not talk about it? And why not have convincing arguments to one another? After all, that's why we went, all went to school. You, you can convince me by logic. Why not? Not by force. Simply one more. And uh, the ITRs will try to see how connectivity can be uh, really uh, affordable, uh, affordable and available everywhere so that this traffic will continue to grow. So there will be more innovation. We haven't seen anything yet in, the, in, the, in the what will be coming in 20 years if connectivity continues to grow, and especially in the developing world. This industry is driven by human brain. That is one natural resource that is equally distributed everywhere. No nation, race, culture, or religion has more or less of that. It's human brain. Governments are asked to make sure that people are, are trained, those brains are trained, that they will be more powerful. 
So we address them under those uh, uh, angles. I believe that we have a room to talk. Now, despite the fact that we have uh, 193 member states, and each member state is free to bring anyone in his delegation, when people are telling you, oh, I choose the closed organization, what prevents US, we, we don't ask the title of every delegation of the US, dele of US uh, delegation, or any other country. They can, any country can organize its civil society, its organization, to bring the delegation they want. Countries are now organizing through the wicked, they're organizing national consultation processes to talk about it. And we're encouraging it. I have asked our council to do so and to authorize me to publish the document on the web so that there will be no WikiLeaks. <laughs> <laughs> so that the real information will be the one provided by us. And when people say, oh, you can't access IQ documentation, do you call the US ambassador and ask him, is your representative there, ask him to provide you the information? We have a channel in which we, we, we are, a mechanism we are using. But that is very clear that every citizen can therefore have access to that. That's how we are expected. So instead of shooting on us, you can shoot on your own government if they are not providing you what you are asking for. But did you ask them? I'm sure if you ask them, they will provide it to you. We, have, we are unique in the sense that we have, in addition to our 193 member states, we have over 700 private companies that are members of the union. Apple is the latest to join, or they sent us. Just, like, just two weeks ago. And we are very really pleased with that. We hope that we can continue to develop dialogue, because the only difference between private sector and governments is when it comes to voting. Tell me when was the last time you voted on an issue? We well, only vote when it comes to electing me and the management team. On the real issue, we never vote because voting means, in our jargon, winners and losers. And it's not acceptable for making stand-up or making a managing spectrum. Those of you who were at the World Radio Conference in January have seen that we have agreed all on all agenda items. We brokered, I brokered in my office a deal between Israel and Palestine. I, we came on a plenary session to read the common uh, resolution agreed by Israel and Palestine that can happen only in Nigeria. And I've said during my time as Secretary General, there would be no voting on issues. Why would you put a one country in a minority against the others? But some of the people who are against uh, the system to be discussed, they are saying that oh, why you as a voting where, where a country like the US only has only one vote. They are questioning the one country, one vote system. We they question the one man, one vote session, system as well. To me, there's nothing wrong with one country, one vote. But again, we're trying to avoid it. Why should we do that? At the end of WRC, all of the parties who were opposing each other were happy. At one point, you see someone looking back and say, hey, wait a minute, why are these guys happy? Did I miss something here? <laughs> yeah. No, they haven't missed anything. Because uh, that's how we function. We want to make sure that everybody comes out of it winner. And that's how it works. That's the, that's the culture we have had. And it's continued to be there. And the US has been playing a very key role in this. The US is a funding member of the, of the union. And the problem of fact is with the oldest organization, which is dealing with the youngest uh, uh, technologies as well, it has been able to adapt itself to technologies as it evolved as well. Being old is not necessarily bad. So we, we, we are in this. Uh, 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 I was very much uh, 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 sad to see that uh, there were some sensationalist claims in the press that Wicked will definitely be about uh, internet controlling the internet governance. What is internet governance? It 
to me, the I am a contract. The I can uh, 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 relations between the US government and the I can very sign agreement that dealing with the reservoirs. To me, that's a main thing that is in the internet governance. And we don't need to talk about that in, in Wicked. It doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with it. Why should we? What we try to do will have, I hope, a very positive effect on internet because internet will continue to flow. If there is too much traffic jam, service quality will go down, for sure. When you start sending mails and they don't get through after it is two seconds, or children will not be able to play the games and high speed games anymore. That's the problem. Or we will not be able to do to access the homework. This is the issue we are talking about here. We talk about security. I hope we have some key principles in each of all those things, including security. Just principles to agree upon so that we keep the system secure and we commit ourselves. I've been very provocative when, after the World Summit on Information Society that assigned ITU to dealing with cyber security, I've been very provocative in saying we need a cyber arms treaty. I know there's nobody who can sign that now. People are not ready. They're not mentally ready for it. Because what do we put in the cyber arms treaty? Because first of all, we need to, to avoid a cyber war. The best way, way to win a war is to avoid it in the first place. And if you to win a war, it shouldn't take place in your territory. Because the war, if it takes place in your territory, it may even at the end you win. There is destruction in your territory. Same thing applies to cyber war. And what is true offline is true online. What I'm saying, when we put that in the cyber arms treaty, one, every country should commit itself to protect it, to, to give access to its citizens. The access. First, why you protect them if not, they're not, they're not letting them access it? You don't want every citizen to be in hell or to carry to have to carry a gun. Of course, I know this is another debate here because people are free to carry guns here in the US and there's a very strong lobby for that. But uh, there are some who don't necessarily want to carry guns, but they're expecting something from, from government who has to work with their paying their their their, their, uh, their taxes. And second, you would expect all countries to commit themselves to protect the citizens. And two, three, you expect every country not to attack, to commit themselves, not to attack another country first, just like you do in the, in the nuclear arms treaty. Because the issue we're dealing with is as powerful as nuclear arms. The only difference is that instead of the nuclear arms being, uh, uh, being in, in the hand of few superpowers, uh, this thing is in the hand of every citizen of this planet. I say it's driven by human brain. You can find the genius everywhere. So anyone can be a superpower and creating the world's botnets or viruses. The most little virus ever created was the I love you bug so far. We've seen many uh, different viruses. The I love you bug had more widespread in the world than any other one back in 2002. It was made by someone from the Philippines in a mud house from the laptop less than thousand dollars. It's human brain. So let's not let's face it, this thing, let's avoid it. The best way to win this war is to avoid it in the first place. And we can do that. So and the last thing we see in a cyber arm treaty is uh, that countries commit themselves to work together to fight crime. Because the criminal may be out of the borders. Now, the difficulty we face is that there are so many uh, differences in even defining a crime. <coughs> what is pornography? Is it a crime in some countries? It's not a crime in some others. When is it talk, you talk about adults? This is why during the debates, when I put the global cybersecurity agenda together, uh, back in 2007, 
and the high level expert group, they were fighting. I felt the high level expert group, since I'm an engineer, I said, engineers always agree, they never fight. I was wrong. I thought only lawyers are fighting. <laughs> I was wrong. They were fighting too. The ideological differences in this, the ethical differences in this, is as, as too wide, unfortunately. So I, came, I, I brought down to what I call the lowest common denominator at the time child, children, child online protection. I said, let me find something that will bring people together so that we do something. We work as we talk. Otherwise, we, we want more, and the criminals are working. Some people will talk about freedom, while the criminal's freedom is more, will be more important than the freedom of their, their, their uh, 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 victims, unfortunately. We've seen uh, the latest videos uh, that is, uh, that is uh, putting so much uh, trouble in the world, unnecessary trouble. We could avoid it. How do we ask ourselves to come to a point where we are, are saying, uh, Yes, we do all these things, but let's refrain from being offensive to others. Let's respect others. There's nothing wrong with that. What's too uh, 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 offline is too online. You have to respect. You have to, to do for each other that we can do and, and unnecessary or avoid unnecessary to have to attack others. So. Let me come back now to, to the wicked. Uh, I believe that uh, the wicked will be an, an opportunity for us to, to work together, to try to find ways and means that will make the networks open for everyone. At least that's the intention that we have here. And there is no, no recommendation at all that is opposing that in the, so far. And everyone is free to bring in a recommendation. For the first time, we've said, I requested the board, my council, to authorize me to receive uh, uh, contribution. What we call, by the way, what we call contribution, I just learned in Washington uh, two days ago that uh, contrib some, what we call in our jargon contributions is not, is not meant to be financial contribution. <laughs> It's an intellectual contribution, you know, that we're talking about. We're expecting people to contribute uh, uh, intellectually in the debate, giving some uh, opposing uh, views to the views that I think that are extreme, so that end of the day we'll come at this conference and negotiate something that's workable for everyone to make a win. -win. We know that if we do so, some of the governments that we believe, some, some believe that our oppressive governments will have no choice but to be access to their citizens. If the citizens have access, the citizens will be able to take care of their own governments. I don't need to have a 50 years blockade around Cuba if I give them a mobile phone, each and every, every one of them. There will be somebody who will be more powerful, more, more smarter, and, and, and luckier than, than Fidel Castro and hope for it if necessary. People will do that. So what I'm saying here, we've seen that in the Arab Spring, people were able to take care of their own business. And we take proud of the fact that when the, when the, the, the Arab Spring started, I remember in uh, Egypt, one day there was, for the first time, the fixed line, the, the mobile, and the internet were all cut off. I tried to reach my good friend Tariq Kamel three times. Couldn't reach him. I wrote a, a paper, which I, and I called some journalists and made a statement that it's not acceptable that this be happened. The systems which cannot cut off the thing. And what I said at the time, I remember, information is a powerful tool in the hands of the people. And when government take away that tool, it becomes a bomb in their hands, the religious flow. And that's what happened. <laughs> when Myanmar cut off the internet, I was the only one who made a press release that day to condemn it. I was even surprised that a year later when they, they had the, the hurricane, when, I, uh, when the UN people were trying to come in, they said, no, we don't want any UN person here, the any UN organization. I feel was the only organization that was accepted. 
I sent 100 satellite terminals there to help relief there. And they accepted. I thought that they may be still angry at me, but I condemned them publicly. But I was the only voice at that time who did that. Just to show you that, uh, uh, I mean, I, I was not worried that if I, I, I condemn <laughs> the calling out of the internet that somebody would say, oh, look, why are you going to but you are trying to control the internet? Are you trying to, to, to do the internet governance? No. It's one of the goods that are dealing with telecoms today. And I believe that that needs to be open. And we have to do that in all countries in the world. So uh, I, um, uh, I will again uh, state that uh, our the concern about uh, censorship, if anyone have seen any any uh, proposal around that it can be counterbalanced and nothing will come out of it that is contradicting our article 33 of the constitution which, which recognizes the right of the public to correspond by means of an international service of public that's clearly define why government cannot do censorship it's clearly the constitution and therefore i don't see any proposal that would be contradicting that. And, I, and I, it's, it's, it's a, essentially, it's a clear defense of people's right to communicate. And uh, we de define this, the right to communicate as a basic human need, as I said, and recognizes their inherent need to access telecommunication infrastructure. But let's be clear for the fact that all countries, and I say all countries, do impose some kind of restrictions on various forms of speech, including telecommunications, for example, to protect copyright or to prevent defamation, racism, or some other types of unacceptable behavior. Countries do have restrictions on that. I don't see any country in the world that will oppose that. And those are type of things should continue. So some country goes further and places restrictions on the use of telecommunications for areas such as gambling, pornography, hate speech, negation of genocide, the circulation of abusive pictures of children, and even certain types of political speech that could be inflammatory. I was hearing this today at uh, lunchtime, uh, just before lunchtime, uh, 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 saying that Google indeed had a kind of the video, this is uh, an acceptable video uh, on uh, some sites uh, in some countries that are not acceptable in their culture. I'm glad Google did that because it's not acceptable. Now, if those countries have done, have done it, some people will say, oh, they are trying to, 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 play, to they're going against free speech. That's a problem. We need to face it. Somehow, we, that, that those are behaviors that are sometimes that we can leave one another, another and accept each other. Uh, so we have to talk about those things so that they don't happen. So minimum acceptable behaviors that we're trying to put in here to make sure that people agree on it, even if we don't have to list them. As principles, and if you want the idea to last long enough, it can only be based on key principles that will then define, some, like a constitution, we the people define some common principles that we all agree upon, and we hope that we drive the system. And we do it in a major sake of all, all the more, because I hope that every government will, 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 will gather the, 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 the information from all its citizens from all parties. The consumer, uh, uh, consumer rights advocates, we do have some consumer rights advocates uh, uh, of our NGOs as members, as certain members of ITU. They can still continue to play their role. So simply put, Wicked 12 is about putting ICT in the hands of people. It's about free flow of information. It's about promoting affordable and equitable access to all, including people with disabilities. And I hope there will be enough contribution in those areas. There are already some. The continued development of broadband, including includes focus on energy efficiency, combating climate change, 
continuing investment in network services and applications, and perhaps more, most importantly, in this fast-moving world, continuing to promote a harmonious and conducive international environment that will continue to drive innovation. So uh, affordability, reducing of cost, mobile roaming, preventing from misuse of telephone numbering systems, and empowerment of consumers. Those are some of the key principles that I would like to have touched on, not in too much detail, because we won't be telling uh, 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 ISPs and the operators how much they exchange among each other. No key principles of equal treatment. That's what I expect from this, and I hope that people will come with clashes of brains, not clashes of people. From friction comes light, always from friction comes light, even the friction of lights, of, of, of minds and brains. That's what I really expect from that conference. So, ladies and gentlemen, these are the few uh, uh, words that I wanted to put here to really uh, 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 put, set the, the record straight. Uh, but of course, uh, I'm very happy that uh, the the the, 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 the resistance or the opposition to, that has started has, has uh, really calmed down from the way it was in the very beginning because as people started to understand and started to, uh, to access the, the thing. But the good news is that really it gave us a lot of attention. I mean, if I had $10 million for, for PR, I wouldn't be able to have a whole day hearing at the US Senate or the US Congress on ITU, and I could hear them talking about me. And thanks, David, by the way, you said I was, I was a fine man, so I didn't know that. I went back home and looked at myself and I said, hey, I'm a, you're a fine man. And David said, David said, but I respect you the same way because you had some values that you, you, you put forward that are real concerns, but we have to make sure that those concerns are not put in the ITRs, and, and uh, those concerns are genuine if we address them in the ITRs. Will, will not be it will not get there and will not find solutions after it because our membership is not even equipped for that. In the whole IQ, I only three, I only have three lawyers. If I, I start entering into into legal issues, the one I won't be there. I'm trying to to litigate now, raising the issue of the patent litigation issue put it on the table, but I'm, what, I, what, what I'm doing is to bring in, to bring all the mind, say, hey, look here, we have a problem here. There are too, many, too much litigation. It's not good news for the lawyers because they are getting money, money out of this, but uh, I, I think that we have to continue innovation in this. Uh, the current patent uh, fights are simply not fair to everyone, and it will, it's not fair to competition. You have to treat everyone, including those uh, 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 that are competing against you equally, so that innovation will continue. So uh, I will stop here, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you again for, for the attention. And of course, I will be available for any information that I have. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Hamadou. We, we do have some time for some questions, and Secretary General uh, very graciously said that he would take some. So here's one right here. And if you could identify yourself. Thank you. Uh, this is Dr. Utsu Mei of the uh, Global University System. I really appreciate your mentioning about the uh, information age, coming to the knowledge age. And uh, I attended the uh, your uh, conference in uh, Tunis. That time, UNESCO people saying uh, ITU is stealing a, a motto. Yeah. So, yeah, so okay. if, if okay. you can ask a question, okay. then, yeah, did, did, all right. yeah. A question. question. Yeah. We're looking for questions. What I'm saying yeah. is that uh, those uh, knowledge age need to be uh, creative. And uh, uh, the internet is a grower. Then people are talking about the old broadband. We the one created, created the broadband. That is the Tom Mansher from Ghana. And who are they applying that? He's a 
from uh, Victor Lawrence of Harikon. We need okay. to meet mm -hmm. And this is question. the West, West Coast and Africa. Yeah. So what I am saying is that in the 20th century business is that the raw material is a tangible. 21st century raw material is an intangible brain. So why not try to create globally collaborative creativity around Africa using that sort of brain there? Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, and uh, your name is uh, very familiar because our former Secretary General, who I want to to from the long distance cousin, so right. but you are your brother or uh, a distance yeah. cousin. Uh, in Africa, we have seen that uh, we organized in 2007 our first uh, Connect the World series. We call it Connect Africa. We are the last one. In, in Panama City for the Americas, uh, Connect Africa Americas uh, in June this year. And Connect Africa was a way to, to try and uh, drive, uh, uh, to, to attract investment on the African continent. We brought heads of state. We tried to put uh, ICT as an enabler and as a tool for, for, for development. And we, we know that it's driven by the policy vision first. We are asking the African leaders to have the vision, share the vision. And uh, that's what we had. We had a very good result out of that. As, as being an African, that was very important for me because uh, uh, more than half of the LDC countries in the world are in Africa. And I think that we have to do something. And ICT is one opportunity. I was saying personally to the heads of state who gathered there that I, as an African, I was feeling ashamed. We had, for 50 years of independence, our development model was based on three words health, assistance, charity. And it didn't work for 50 years. And you, if you try something for 50 years, it doesn't work. You try something else. I said, I'm wearing an industry that does not need help. All it needs is a good. A vision that will turn into a regulatory framework that we can and private sector will invest. When I was briefing the heads of state at the airport with President Kagame at the time we were meeting them, I was asking each and every one of them, is it, Mr. President, is it a crime to make profits in your country? They were saying to me, no, of course not. Why are you asking that? I said, well, we have over 250 business leaders here. I've been telling them that. Can you repeat them that? They believe me, they would like to hear it from you too. As a result, what did he have? I, I was asking the business leader, tell us how much you're going to invest, and you make profit out of it. There's nothing wrong with it. Not how much you're going to give me or give the countries. As a result, there was $55 billion commitment for investment over five years period. And I bet um, over the five years period, there will be over $75 billion. That's what happened in Africa. The real miracle. We're talking about the mirror, more than miracle. Back in, in, 10 years ago, there was less than 0.5% penetration in mobile. Today, there are over 70%. And there have been, we have seen new services, new applications being designed, <coughs> conceived, developed, and exported from Africa. The mobile banking, m -Pesa, was an African solution to African problems. People who are transferring $5, $10, for which the current banking system is not fit, they came up with this solution. Oh, can do it through a mobile phone. Now it's done everywhere. We had Connect Arab State in, in Doha last year, in March. It was easier, it was a great success. It's a different formula. This is a region that is wealthy, that the region has developed. And there are positive opportunities out there. We look at those projects and new things that will make the Arab world even more connected. There are over $300 billion commitment for investment in that region. So th these are the approach where we are taking in each region. So I hope that answers your question. Mr. Secretary General, there, I think there are lots of people who would like to say something, so might, maybe we can just... Well, I'll just take a couple, okay. maybe three or four okay. together. Okay, okay. Henning, Okay, okay. Uh, Henning Schlitzmanning, I 
quick question, just so I understand a little bit better. You mentioned, this, if I understood you correctly, a set of principles that one might agree on, such as freedom of expression and others. But uh, in at least U.S. Uh, tradition, was it really only been meaningful if you had a means of enforcing those by uh, judges and an, uh, an established body of rules and expectations that go along with that? So I wonder if it is more than just a declaration of good intent as to what do you envision how this would uh, have practical effect given the lack of a UN Supreme Court or equivalent uh, mechanisms. I don't think we want the UN black helicopters doing that. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, people were saying that the, black, the blue helmets were coming, so we should see the black, the black helicopters uh, will come too. So. With the, with, the, with the blue helicopter. Yes, absolutely. Let's have some additional questions. If you have a very interesting question, I am ready to. There were other, any other? No others? Oh, oh. Um, Heather and then David. We'll, we'll take uh, two or three together. Is anybody over um, here? Welcome. Thank you for coming. Heather Hudson from, not from Alaska, but I'm having helped the ITU. I'm very glad to hear what you're saying. I'm wondering, you, you mentioned affordability um, and extending access. And in the mobile world, which as you said, has grown so dramatically, um, competition was something that really helped, that make, helped to make that happen in the developing world as well, compared to the structure that we started with in, in the West. Um, and so I'm wondering if competition plus in many countries, universal service funds or some way of subsidizing areas where competition doesn't look very viable, whether you think that those will work for broadband or whether you see a need for other strategies since you made those two um, com comments on those two priorities for the weekend. Thank you, Hi, Dave Burstein, I write about this stuff. I mean, first, thank you for an extraordinarily eloquent presentation that put to shame some of the million dollar lobbyists that we've been hearing before because the thoughts were something special. The question I have is after Larry Strickling of the US NTIA said we absolutely will not accept sending, power, send, sending party pays, which was before you got here, would it be interesting to draw the distinction between sending party pays which my yet no friends want, and the power of a government, a less developed country in Africa perhaps, to put an ordinary tax on things like exchange and transfer, uh, which is making it a government priority prerogative as opposed to a corporate prerogative and might get around some of the objections. Uh, Ken, over there. Hi, uh, this is Ken Carter, I'm with Google. I wanted to follow Dave's question because he mentioned sending party pays. Uh, it was brought up in the last panel. It occurs to me that in, in Europe, in the mobile uh, telecommunications networks, they had sending party pays. And it didn't work, it led to high prices, low, low usage, uh, and the European Commission stepped in and put those uh, wholesale prices on a glide path. And it occurs to me that you're inviting more regulation with sending party pays. Well, sir, I didn't understand the last part of your question. <laughs> if you impose a sending party pays regime, you create artificial incentives which have to be cured by wholesale regulation. And so, are we inviting global regulation? One more question, and we'll ask the Secretary General. What we oh, um, Raise your hand high, yeah. especially when you're blue on blue, it's difficult to see. Uh, yes, I'm Ellen Riley. Um, thank you very much. I did enjoy this. Uh, one of the things is we tend to think that technology is the leader for um, getting the path of GDP development. So, in fact, because the cost of education delivery has dropped significantly, uh, would that be a faster lead and technology follows? So is there multiple paths for getting what we think is going to work for so Some of these, by the way, I think were are great questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. those are uh, really very interesting questions. The first thing on the enforcement. 
right? Uh, and the capability of ITU to do that. Uh, I mean, people who compare this to WTO, for instance, where they have a, a body test the tribunal. If you can complain about a country, and there will be country will be uh, penalized for having done the practice. We don't have that in ITU. And it's, it's a good thing that we don't have that. And uh, we don't expect that uh, we come up with some any regulation that will bring the necessity to bring in a non-enforcement agency because uh, we don't need it. So the blue helmets are really not needed in this, especially not the helicopters, because look at our standards. I two standards are even called recommendation. It's so soft. We call them recommendations, but the whole world adopts them. If you don't, you will not be able to communicate. That's the thing. Mm. If the smallest island has a problem in adopting, adopting that recommendation, you will say, you will say, okay, I have a problem. And we have to fix it, because if we don't fix it in that small island, guess what? The US ambassador who will live there will not be able to communicate with the rest of the world. So it's been a very simple thing that has enabled us to really unfold things naturally without having to go to issue. But of course, we do have a little bit of dispute segment mechanism you know, somewhere, which is soft, which is our regulation one. The RRB constantly receives complaints from one country. So I see Dr. Hesa from Qatar here complaining, <laughs> smiling because I mean, uh, her, her satellites have been uh, targeted to many interferences, uh, unfortunately, and they put that uh, in the regular relation work. We're trying to solve everything. We have some countries, neighboring countries, that have some problems, but we, we fix them. We try not to make them political problems. But of course, most of the time, the issue is more content related than the technical issues. And all technical problems have technical solutions. And I believe that if you, that that's why we are trying to put here uh, a mechanism that is workable. We hope that everyone will come to this meeting with better ideas on how they feel is going to work. Because if there is no enough enough uh, uh, rule for this traffic, there will be traffic jams. And, and something that, that and. and we cannot find solutions that are workable for everyone, and I hope that that's what we're going to do. And I really believe that uh, uh, the old like ITRs did not have to come with any settlement, like any mechanism of a conflict resolution. We hope that this one also will not be, it will be exactly the same. And we're certainly not going to think where we're going to be voting in the issue. I said it not during my time as Secretary General. We never voted before, it's not going to be now. And I hope to maintain that. Uh, we will come to agreement with some of the things that uh, we all agree on. We put them on the table. Some of the things that we will not agree on. But I don't want people to say, don't discuss this. We don't want you to talk about this. Why do you want to oppose that? To anyone? Tell us why. If you tell me I should not discuss something, I tell you, why don't you want me to discuss it? You will explain and say, again, does it make sense? If it makes sense, I say, OK, take it out. That's what happens really generally in the ITU. So we, we still will continue to do that. Uh, Ms. Hudson's, uh, uh, Dr. Hudson's question uh, uh, on affordability and competition and uh, universal service funding. Uh, we certainly would uh, not like to see subsidies. We don't encourage subsidies. We don't encourage overtaxing. I just wrote to the Director General of IMF, Chris Lagarde, uh, a couple of weeks ago, because I came across a report from the Philippines where the IMF uh, expert was uh, recommending to uh, the government that, hey, telecom industry is a, is a cash cow. You can tax them. It's one way to get money. I was telling her, look here, it's our industry, and we are not encouraging too much taxing. And it's a tool for the other sectors to develop. So don't only have that industry, let's grow. And that's our position. And I say that uh, uh, very uh, uh, with conviction. I came from private sector to ITU directly. When I was running campaign, I was saying to people, I'm from the private sector, I'm good. 
<laughs> and they put it for me. And they related me, meaning that they have nothing against private sector. If it was taboo, I wouldn't say it. You know, so these are the things that we, we the, the values that we, we, we believe that are making IQ very strong. And we believe that uh, those can happen. Now, we have identified a number of countries that they have gathered a lot of money for universal service funds. And the fund is not moving, it's not, nothing is happening. So we are telling, we are recommending to them, how about using that fund for, for uh, broadband development, infrastructure, and national e-applications? Because, we def and the Broadband Commission has defined the role of governments and private sector very well. Government has to set up the, 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 the policy, and private sector will invest in the infrastructure and the applications. Government should also come back again with some few national e-services, e e-government, uh, e-health, e or e-education, that will trigger, trigger the demand, that will get the ball rolling. That's, that's, the, that's the, 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 the phenomenal basis of the success of the Silicon Valley. It works, and it works everywhere. It works, and work again. So that, those are some of the things that we tell them. That. So, so I was actually, Secretary General just told yeah. that actually there's a class that's coming in here at 5 o'clock. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, we're talking, we, we, by the way, would stay all night because this is actually fa fascinating. That's why we're here. But um, I think that the Columbia Business School actually thinks that this is their classroom. <laughs> so, but, okay. Okay. so we have to finish? Now? Yeah, I think we should. Okay. Uh, but, but you might want to just address this Let me just question. address the, the issue uh, by our friend from Google. Uh, and uh, thank you for that question. And in fact, we, we, if you are right, we, we want to avoid artificial regulation. We say too much regulation kills the regulation. Like too much tax kills tax. You know, that's some of the lessons in, 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 in the economic uh, field. And, and we believe in that. And we're trying to, to say that we don't, shouldn't have too much regulation. Uh, uh, you rightly said cost of it. Uh, no, no, it's not you who said that. The cost of uh, education and technology has gone down. Now, technology has always gone ahead of regulation. It's always like that. Regulation will always catch up. With, with, with technology, that's what happened. It's a rule of because you don't know, you can put a regulation for something you don't know is going to be because you don't know which direction is coming. Nobody in this room knows what's going to happen tomorrow, but we know it's going to be good. And let's work together to make it good. That's for me, that's a key lesson from that. And I hope that we will really uh, come up with uh, uh, the debate in this issue on a uh, uh, on a human manner, while we are trying to just really have a uh, brain crashes, and I'm, I'm sure something good will come out of it. Some people think of me, oh, he's a secretary general, or he's a secretary, he's going to be a loose canon. Why is that? You will lose a canon when you have your future behind you. Your future behind you. I'm not even 60 yet. I love six. <laughs> Why should I? Do? And I challenge anyone if I've said something that I didn't do and this thing that I didn't say over 12, 12 14 years that I've been in ITU, yeah. I always do it. Because you can say anything politely to people and get praise or praise, and that's what you gain from it. You can convince each one another. And, and, so that's, and again, that's why we went all went to school and we're here. To debate that so that we can understand each other. And you know, we have the responsibility to make this world a better place together. And this industry is, is, is driving. And we should not do anything that would be stopping it. It's not only for countries like the US. In the developing world, it's even more urgent. And I know about it because I'm from there. But I'm sure that many of you have been in those countries as well, and you have the same passion and, 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 and uh, goodwill as I do. So we can work together. So let, let's, uh, I, I believe that uh, a lot of uh, things have gone into the US politics here in the election year, unfortunately. Some people want to have more visibility to, and, and show that they are more anti-UN or anti-IGU uh, than anybody else. But November will pass and December is a conference. I hope that it will be a conference.